member, Service Employees International Union, the first woman ever to hold that post. She was elected to that position in 2010 um, and actually started working at SEIU in 1980. And throughout that career, she has been a champion for all working Americans and a tireless advocate for a higher minimum wage, affordable quality health care for all, and a fair immigration process. It's no secret, of course, that unions have suffered uh, a decline in the U.S. over the last many decades, coinciding, not coincidentally, with an explosion in inequality. At the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, we are keenly interested and fund research in the relationship between these two trends. Um, and we know that to reverse the rise of inequality, we also have to reverse the decline in worker bargaining power. So when it comes to how to do this, we could think of no better person to lay out a vision here at Vision 2020 for the future of organized labor uh, than Mary Kay Henry. She has agreed to take some questions uh, at the end of her talk, so please, in between bites of dessert, uh, enter your questions on Slido. And now, please welcome SEIU President Mary Kay Henry. That's why I came to Equitable Growth, because you link these things, and I'm incredibly grateful to be invited. I'm very sorry that I'm interrupting a break where you're uh, enjoying nourishment, but eat away. Um, I want to thank Heather Boucher and everyone for bringing us together today. I was really impressed both by the story of Sadie Alexander and by the Structural Growth Panel. I think equitable growth is a, a leader when it comes to shining a light on an economy uh, about who this economy is working for and who is getting left out. And that is why the push for the distributional GDP that's expressed in the Measuring Real Income Growth Act is such a good idea. It will bring a deeper understanding to the true scope of the economic challenges facing working people in America. On behalf of the two million members of SEIU, I want to say this conversation about building a fairer economy is working moms and dads awake at night. And Nyla Payton is one of those working parents. Nyla lives with three children in Pittsburgh in the working class African American community of East Liberty. It's a neighborhood that developers are trying to rebrand as the village of the East Side as they gentrify it. As her neighborhood gets pricier, Ny Nyla works hard to keep her family afloat. She's trying to make it from paycheck to paycheck with a job as an administrative assistant in the pathology unit at UPMC Presbyterian Hospital. Her hospital is part of a gigantic system called the University of Pittsburgh Medical System, a health system worth $19 billion that operates 40 hospitals and 600 clinical locations. More than 85,000 people work there. UPMC dominates Western Pennsylvania's hospital market, and in the late 1990s, several Pittsburgh hospitals merged to create UPMC. And then they acquired and merged with competing hospitals across 29 counties in Pennsylvania. Many Pittsburghers will tell you that the location of UPMC's headquarters symbolizes its power and influence over their community. UPMC now occupies the U.S. Steel Tower in downtown Pittsburgh. UPMC's rise to market dominance is a story that you all know better than I do that's being repeated in many places across the United States. Heather's new book cites research by Lee Moore Daphne, Robin Lee, and Kate Ho that shows how hospital mergers are driving prices up for patients. That dominance in the market creates problems for workers too. UPMC's domination of Western Pennsylvania's hospital market gives it something close to monopsony power over the labor market for hospital workers in the region. Nyla has worked at UPMC for almost 14 years. She says she enjoyed her work at first, but she soon got frustrated with feeling stretched thin because of short staffing. 
And on a school bus, when I met her at uh, UPMC Presbyterian and she joined me to go to the next hospital because she was on strike that day over the short staffing and her wages, she shared with me something that no worker should have to go through in this nation, that she's developed embarrassing bladder problems because she's required to cover her position for such long stretches that she didn't get regular bathroom breaks. She's also gotten frustrated with how expensive it is to care for her family with the health care coverage that UPMC requires all their employees to participate in. I know it's hard to believe, but Nyla is in medical debt to UPMC, like 60% of her service and tech coworkers. They're in debt because it costs so much to get care at the same UPMC hospitals that only keep their doors open because of the work that they do every day. Nyla is a leader in the campaign to create a check on UPMC's power. She's a leader in a union for UPMC healthcare workers. Since 2011, UPMC hospital workers have been organizing to get a seat at the table so they can negotiate to get paid enough to keep ahead of their monthly bills. When fast food workers in Pittsburgh joined the growing Fight for 15 and a union movement, in 2013, UPMC workers linked arms with them. Fast food workers and hospital workers stood united to call for the $15 wage floor and for fast food work and for hospital work. In response, UPMC's Vice President for Human Resources told the New York Times in 2015 that the hospital system could not afford to raise the pay. He said in 2014 that it wasn't realistic to think that every UPMC job could sustain a family. But Nyla and her coworkers believed that's not true, and they didn't back down. They kept marching and striking and fighting alongside the McDonald's workers, child care workers, home care workers, and other service and care workers throughout Pennsylvania who are united under the banner of the Fight for 15 and a union. I'm incredibly proud that SEIU members supported and shared resources with this movement going back to the first time that fast food workers struck in November of 2012. Their collective action challenged and then changed the conventional wisdom about wages and work in our country. They pushed employers and elected officials who call the shots in our economy to finally finally take action and start to raise wages. In 2016, this movement made UPMC's executives blink. They announced that UPMC will gradually lift its minimum wage to $15 by 2021. This is, yeah. This is a step forward, and it's a credit to the courage and determination of Nyla and all of, who, all of her co-workers who are building her union, but it's not enough. Nyla and her UPMC co-workers still can't negotiate for better health insurance, staffing, or scheduling because UPMC is doing everything in their power to stop them from bargaining as a union. When Nyla and other workers first started their campaign to organize a union, there was huge support across all of these hospitals for the idea. Hundreds of people came together in meetings to discuss next steps. But then UPMC cracked down. It fired, harassed, and disciplined workers who wanted to form a union. Hospital workers tried to assert their right to organize, filed scores of NLRB charges that detail how UPMC had violated their rights. In a 2015 ruling, an administrative law judge found that UPMC, and I quote, because we don't often get uh, decisions like this from the NLRB, engaged in such egregious and widespread misconduct so as to demonstrate a general disregard for employees' statutory rights. UPMC was ordered to make financial restitution to workers it fired in 2012 because they wanted a union. It's 2019 and UPMC has still not paid those workers what they're owed. UPMC was ordered to post a notice and make an announcement to acknowledge to all the people that supported the union that they broke the law back in 2018, 2014, 
but it still hasn't posted that notice either. What's happening to people who work at UPMC is happening to working Americans across our economy. UPMC can get away with ignoring its employees' rights under the law because the law protecting those rights is so weak and the rules are broken. It's almost impossible for working people to organize using today's law. It's especially difficult for people who do service and care work. And that's not an accident. When Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act in 1935, it excluded domestic workers and farm workers and child care workers and home care workers from the right to collectively bargain. Congress kept them out because powerful white lawmakers were dead set on stopping black and brown working people who did these jobs from gaining any power. And over time, corporations have found more and more ways to exclude more people by aggressively fissuring the relationship between lead employers and workers. A growing number of employers in this economy pretend that they have no legal responsibility for their workers or any obligation to collectively bargain. Millions of jobs in this economy have been misclassified, contracted, outsourced, permit attempt, franchised, or turned into an app-based gig so companies can evade accountability when it comes to creating jobs that people can actually live on. Because of this combination of race-based exclusion and job fishering, our union estimates that as many as 45% of American workers are now effectively excluded from having the opportunity to collectively bargain. All of this precarity produces more profit and flexibility for corporations, but far less security and stability for working people. As corporations consolidate in health, retail, fast food, and other sectors that the people in this room could name, it's too easy for employers to throw up barriers to block workers from joining together in unions. These organizations and unions could act as countervailing power to all that concentrated wealth. And this has disturbing consequences, as we've heard today in the panel on structural power, for the communities that we live in and for our entire democracy. Inequality and insecurity help fear and hate grow. Inequality and insecurity make it easier for some politicians to point the fingers at workers of color and in immigrants as the other. This division means that we can no longer take the stability of our democracy for granted. Extremists and forces of hate threaten to make a shambles of our government and our elections. SEIU members and the leaders of the Fight for 15 in a union movement believe it's time to rewrite the rules. It's time to empower working people to join together to fight for balanced, shared prosperity and a strong, inclusive, multiracial democracy. To do that, our contribution to a much broader movement that's raising many other issues and policy is to fight for unions for all. Unions for all is our fight to push our elected representatives at every level of government to challenge corporations to sit down and negotiate with workers. It's a fight to update our laws to make sure that all working people have the opportunity to join a union, no matter what kind of work we do. Last year, researchers at MIT Sloan conducted a survey that found 48% of working Americans say they want to join a union. But as most of you know today, less than 11% of Americans are in unions. That means that there's another 37% just by this one study, and I know there are many more, that want to be part of a union but are being kept out. That adds up to at least 58 million working people who want to unite in unions but cannot. We think that there are four bold changes that would make it possible for those millions of Americans to join together in inclusive multiracial unions that put an end to work that traps people in poverty. Number one, 
the next president needs to bring employers, workers, and government together at an industry-wide bargaining table to negotiate wages, benefits, and working conditions. McDonald's workers have been at the forefront of the fight for 15 and a union since the beginning. But McDonald's corporate leadership still insists that it has nothing to do with how much workers in stores that are operated by franchisees are paid. We believe that our next president should convene a national bargaining table to bring McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King together with workers and their union. At that table, they would negotiate job standards for the million direct employees and three million fast food workers across the country who are working for other employers. Once a certain number of workers in a sector show that they want to form a union, get a seat at the table, the Labor Department should recognize them. Then, the government would invite those workers and employers in their sector to negotiate a collective agreement for basic standards. That agreement would extend across the sector. Employers would have to live up to its terms. This is what the rules are in countries like Europe and Canada that McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King actually play by. It stops employers from competing on how low they can push wages down. In countries that currently empower workers to bargain sector-wide, far more workers are included in a process to reach basic agreements on job quality. In Northern U Europe, these sector-wide unions mobilized working class voters to win a social wage that provides health care, child care, parental leave, vacation, and pension support for every working family, whether they're in a union or not. They gain the power to build more equal societies with a higher standard of living for everybody, no matter what kind of work they do. Our goal would be to fight for a new American social wage to create a better way of life for all of us, whether you work at a hospital or a McDonald's or in your car driving for an app-based service. Number two. States and cities have to be allowed to innovate and find new ways to empower workers to or organize unions. States and cities should not be held down by the limits of federal law. Prompted by the Fight for 15 and a union movement and many our allies and partners, cities like Seattle and Washington, D.C., and states like New York and California and Illinois have raised their minimum wages to 15, going above and beyond the pitiful $7.25 in the federal minimum. That should, uh, that these same places in our country should also be free to strengthen workers' right to organize unions above and beyond the minimum rights that we have with federal law. Number three, everybody who works for the government, for a government contractor, for a private enterprise that gets taxpayer subsidies should be paid at least $15 an hour and have the opportunity to bargain up from that by getting a chance to join a union. At UPMC, Nyla Pay Payton's employer is nominally a nonprofit organization. By giving UPMC tax-free status, the people of Pennsylvania give this company a huge tax subsidy worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And like all hospitals in our country, UPMC keeps its door open because of our tax dollars through Medicare, Medicaid, and subsidies offered through the Affordable Care Act. Our dollars should not be used by hospitals to fight against their own workers. Our tax dollars should not be subsidizing employers that use their market power to hold wages down. And finally, number four, every major economic plan, including proposals for the Green New Deal, health care for all, college for all, have to create good family-sustaining union jobs. When we expand health care coverage and strengthen it in this country, let's make sure that the 9 million health care workers that are either excluded or blocked from joining a union get a chance to get a seat at the table. When we win a Green New Deal, let's make sure that the millions of new clean energy workers can join a union and have a seat at the table. When we win college for all, let's make sure that 2 million higher ed workers on a campus can join a union. We know that this is an audacious agenda. We know that we'll have to fight hard to get it passed, but we believe that momentum is turning and a paradigm is shifting, as we've discussed here today. The leading presidential candidates are listening to working people who are fighting for the power to change their lives for the better.
They're responding. Candidates are showing up when stop and shop workers strike, when McDonald's workers strike, when GM workers strike, when Chicago teachers and school employees go out on strike. Leading candidates are putting forward detailed, serious proposals for how to strengthen unions. All major candidates have now introduced plans to make it easier for working people to organize. Some plans are stronger than others, but they all make it easier to join a union. For example, Buttigieg, Castro, O'Rourke, Sanders, and Warren have issued plans that fully support giving American workers the power to bargain by sector. Biden and Harris say they will explore how to create sector-wide bargaining in the US, with Biden proposing a cabinet-level working group to design a plan in the first 100 days if he's elected. Members of SEIU and the Fight for 15 are bound and determined to fight for unions for all because we believe that this is a fight to decide what kind of world our kids will inherit. We will never be able to build healthy communities on a foundation of precarious, non-union, low-wage work. Many of our parents and grandparents helped build powerful unions that transformed low-wage job and factories owned by companies like Ford and GM into middle-class work. We now believe it's our turn. We can and will build a movement to transform service and care jobs, making them the backbone of an inclusive, growing middle class in every part of Canada, Puerto Rico, and the US. Our mission is to build unions that empower black, brown, white, to unite across differences and remove barriers that hold people back because of race, gender, or immigration status. And this is not a new goal for our movement. Back in 1946, Fortune Magazine published a special issue to predict what life in America would look like after the war. And as pr Professor Nina Banks was telling us the story of Sadie Alexander this morning, I started imagining her role in making sure that the unions that working people had organized in the 30s and 40s were on the uh, verge of changing the balance of power. That magazine noted that in the South, growing unions among textile, furniture, and tobacco workers were the only institutions where white and black people worked together towards a common goal. Fortune predicted that the day would inevitably come when rising union power would overturn the non-union Jim Crow order in the South. We now know, of course, that that day did not come. Powerful corporate interests and entrenched white supremacists in the South also recognized and fear the power of multiracial institutions. And the anti-union Taft-Hartley legislation was pushed through Congress one year later to stop the progress of Southern workers were organizing. With Unions for All, we aim to finish the job of overturning the model of low wages, racial division, voter suppression, and unfunded public service. We will use our collective power to fight for wage-led growth that fuels inclusive, sustainable prosperity for all in the South and in every part of the country. This is the defining challenge of our time. Working people are hungry for a change, and we're determined to work with all of you and the incredible ideas and intellectual content you give us to organize from and to win a future for people uh, like Nyla Payton and for her children and all other working families, no matter what our color or where we come from. Thank you very much. Thank you. by asking the first question. Um, as an organizer, I've experienced a lack of enthusiasm from internationals to mobilize organizing campaigns in lower income shops. Can you talk about the importance of unionizing lower income workplaces as well as shops that offer middle class sustaining wages? Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I can. Most of our organizing is in um, poverty wage work of janitors, security officers, nursing home workers, home care, child care, fast food, the workers you just heard me talk about. And I think what's happened in the American labor movement is because the original organizing was catalyzed by industrial workers who were also in poverty wage jobs before they became union jobs, and the employers in steel, rubber, and auto made different decisions. 
Um, I think the trade union movement got spent a lot of time in the industrial sector and didn't move as the economy moved in the same way that we're trying to catch up with the movement to the gig economy in our organizing. And so I think more and more, like we're doing work with the communications workers who are doing a lot of poverty wage work organizing with Verizon workers and with uh, federally subcontracted call center mm. uh, workers. Uh, the Unite Here is doing a lot of work in airline catering. So I think we're beginning to see a trend toward it. And then I think the teachers uprisings, the student uprising, the Me Too movement, the Dreamers, Black Lives Matter, all of these other movements are encouraging workers who think there is no path to imagine, yes, maybe I should walk through the door and strike, even if I don't have the protection of a contract, um, because I see other people joining together and making things better. That's great, and I'll encourage folks that there's still time if people wanna enter questions in on Slido. Um, Another question we have here about gig workers um, in, in California. So you mentioned uh, the movement to try to expand access to unions and uh, there's an ongoing battle, as you know, in California about this. If you had to project forward, the question is, um, one year from now, will Uber and Lyft drivers be unionized employees, non-unionized independent contractors, or something else? Yeah, there's great organizing happening in three different ways in the transportation sector with Uber and Lyft. One of our locals is backing a organization called the Mobile Workers Alliance, and our local union has said, maybe we shouldn't be the bargaining representative, but we should help the, the workers make a demand on those two companies. They're aligned with an independent organization called uh, Mobile uh, Rideshare Drivers United, I think. And that's then um, connected to a 501c3 that's organizing in Northern California. So these are three different kinds of organizations operating in this sector. And we're trying to create a uh, coalition. And my deep hope is that the answer to that question will be yes. But I really want us to think in California about the 1.8 million workers that are operating in this sector and how to use the transportation network agreement to create a framework for the entire sector of delivery workers. Because I think people know, pe uh, people have to skate between all these jobs in order to make a living. And so we've experienced our home care members doing lift work in their off time. Like we're doing a survey now of our service workers and we think close to 20% are in the gig economy trying to make ends meet. So we just are trying to figure out how to help the institutional labor movement get creative in thinking about not applying our 20th century bargaining model to this 21st century economy and listening to what matters most for these workers, because it's different. 20% um, are full time and earning a living off of these jobs, 80% are contingent. So it's a very different way to think about bargaining than what we normally have done. And I guess as a follow-up to that, I mean, how do you think, you mentioned the, some 501c3s who are in this space, how do you think about these worker organizations that have um, po popped up in places where there haven't been unions, and to what extent more, are those, more, yeah, more. to what extent do you see those as collaborators and as potential partners versus competitors? Yeah, and, and, and I actually think um, whatever form the organization takes, as long as working people can join together to bargain a better life, the better and that we need to welcome the innovation as a labor movement. And I think the extent we can, if we can help finance the innovation, sometimes these new organizations in the economy help us imagine a future uh, that our members might be scared of or our members might be more attracted to. Whatever it is, uh, because of the dramatic shifts that are occurring in the economy and because we believe so fiercely, and the ability of people to join together and bargain a better life, we have to be open to all different forms. That's great, and actually I think you might have come in after Carmen Rojas spoke, but she spoke yeah. this morning about the Workers Lab and the role that SEIU played in seeding the innovation yeah. that they've been yeah. um, experimenting with. And not without controversy, I wanna say. <laughs> like there are still leaders in our union that don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we voted as an organization through a democratic process that we needed to 
invest in new forms, and so we're doing it. But I just want to, again, that's the wonderful thing about a labor movement in my mind. You know, the majority, there's processes, we debate, we decide, we roll, you know? And um, it would be great if we could return that sort of basic principle into our democracy as well. <laughs> Uh, in, the, in the short time we have remaining, I think maybe we can do one more question. Um, and let's see. How do unions support grassroots movements like wildcat strikes in right-to-work states? So you talked a little bit about the role of strikes, but in the particularly hostile environments. So that's a question that I could answer much more freely if I wasn't on the record. Because the, the institutional labor movement has rules about the degree to which we can assist because we can be sued under certain rules if workers walk off the job and we provide support, one. Two, if you're not the labor union that is the collective bargaining representative, you have a lot more leeway. So when West Virginia happened, when Arkansas happened, when Arizona happened, we moved SEIU staff and members into those fights because the institutions that represent the workers had a legal constraint. And so that's the biggest way, I think, is, and it wasn't just us. Like, there were uh, PTAs and uh, nursing home employers that released our nursing home members who were moms and dads of the students and wanted to support the uprising. Um, so it was an incredible, it's, a, it's about how do you back the demands of the people that are the most impacted and get out of the way. Um, what NEA did in Arizona I thought was incredible. The local leader of the Arizona Employee Associ Education Association stepped aside and told the 23-year-old who had built a Facebook group of 50,000 in the original Ed for Ed demand, you're in charge, tell me what you need me to do. And he kind of moved the resources of the organization, because that was not a wildcat in the way that um, West Virginia and Arkansas were initially. That was a political mobilization to demand more funding from the state legislature. And um, Arizona Education Association now has 50,000 dues-paying members as a result. You know what I mean? Because the, the institutional leader backed the movement leader because they understood, oh, there's energy happening here. How do we get behind it and support it? And I think that's the kind of flexibility in this moment that I think is required between institutions and movements. You know what I mean? I have, I'm a president of an organization. I like to consider myself a movement leader as well, but I have obligations to protect uh, our members. And so what we, we have to get much more creative in imagining, I think this happened in the uh, ACT UP movement for the LGBT community, for the civil rights movement that was, it, there were institutions that lifted up that weren't in the front, um, that allowed the, the foment. That's what I think is our job right now. That's why I say, whoever wants to help organize poverty wage work in this country, come on in. Never done it before, it doesn't matter. It's more about how do we intensify the demand and call the question on corporate actors in this economy and democracy. Well said. Well, unfortunately, we're, we're out of I'm time, sorry. so that will have to be the last word. But please join me in thanking Mary Kay. Um, and, and before we welcome our next panel, um, I've been told to direct everybody's attention to the TV screens on the side of the stage where we are um, going to be hosting a, a poll question that we hope to jumpstart the conversation in this next panel, which is about structural racism. So the question is, what policy should be the most, uh, would be the most effective at closing the racial wealth gap? Um, please enter your answer in Slido. We realize there's not one magic bullet answer, so you can put more than one word in there, and it will create a beautiful word cloud. So with that, I'll uh, turn it over to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you.